Coming up on this week's episode of Check Your Balances, we talk about Magic Johnson's regret that he could have had $5 billion had he taken a different shoe deal. Stick around. That's coming up next. Check Your Balances is a show produced and owned by Craftwork Capital. The views expressed by the hosts and their guests are personal opinions and should not be considered personal financial advice or the opinion of Craftwork Capital. All investments have risk and may lose money. Consult with your financial advisor, tax preparer, or attorney prior to implementing anything discussed. And please do not use this show as the sole basis for financial decisions. Welcome back to another week of Check Your Balances. I am Ross Anderson, joined as always by my friend and co-host, Dan Maseka. Good to see you, my friend. Good to see you too. I am through, I think, the first four chapters of Michael Lewis's book now. I am uh, a slow consumer of this. Super entertaining and enjoyable. But to throw back to last week's episode, talk about an unlikable guy. Oh, totally. totally. Can you imagine if we just like played video games while producing this podcast? I mean, I don't think either of us are smart enough to do that, by the way. But if we were so bored with a discussion, in a public forum that we were like, yeah, we're just going to play video games while conducting or participating in an interview because this is that uninteresting to me. I'm going to make an admission. I'm embarrassed to say this. And it doesn't happen during the podcast. It doesn't happen during interviews. Every board meeting that I attend, I have a uh, crossword puzzle in the background because I cannot stand just sitting there having discussions that amount to nothing at the end of the day. I think anybody that's ever been on the board of anything can sympathize with that. And, and I say that having made that mistake to be on a condo board on the first place that I owned. The and worst that of all was boards. A miserable experience. I'm sure. Every quarter was just, I, I hate every minute of this meeting and couldn't believe that I had made such a, a terrible mistake. So if you are on an HOA, if you're on a condo board, whatever organization you've been a part of, more power to you because that, that is not fun. I feel for you. Well, that is not what we're talking about today. We're talking about something a little more exciting than that today. Magic Johnson. Love talking magic. There's the new HBO series. I guess it's in its second season called Winning Time. Have you seen that at all? I saw the first season of it. I did not see the second season, and I heard that it got canceled. But the reason that we're talking about it is that this story keeps rebubbling of Magic Johnson's original deal with Converse versus Nike versus adidas that the three main shoe companies that were doing basketball shoes at the time all made a pitch he takes the converse deal the opposite of michael jordan which is that's portrayed in another great recent film which is air which was a an amazon produced show with ben affleck and and matt damon where you see how michael jordan ends up at nike i thought that was fabulous too magic johnson on the other side of that took the money where Nike comes in and says, we're willing to give you 100,000 shares in our company and a dollar a shoe is the reported deal, right? That's supposedly the deal that he got offered. I think that's a little bit unsubstantiated, but that's what he gets offered versus 100,000 a year of just cash money from Converse for every year that he remains a Converse athlete. And by Magic's account... Had he taken that Nike stock and held it for what the almost 45 years since then, it would have been worth $5.2 billion today. A, a pretty shekel of money yeah. right there. Now, Magic's a billionaire, by the way. A recent new owner to the Washington Commanders, which I am super excited about, now has a, an effective business track record. But it seems like this is still irking him that he didn't take this stock deal. And I thought it was interesting because I, I talk, we talked to so many people that have financial regrets. And I think that this plays into that because it's, first of all, it would have been impossible for him to know. And he even talks about this, that his family didn't have that history of stock investing. So he didn't even know what he was really being offered. And... Going back in time, what he was being offered specifically was ownership in a company that might have been gone any day. Like Nike was not thriving at the time that he was offered this deal. He might be just taking payment in a company that was going to be bankrupt. Like what to the layman differentiates one shoe company from another? I mean, that's hard to tell. It's all branding. And 
And Nike did not have a ton of branding in the big sports world. That's why they were pursuing Magic Johnson. Yeah, and that, and that's and that's why they bet the farm on Michael Jordan. And right. I, I I don't I mean who knows right? Like you can't ever go back and replay the past. I think either of those guys could have been the launch pad for Nike. Quite frankly, for sure. I mean, they're similar similar personality or you know on court personalities at a minimum, right? Yeah. I mean, they're flashy, exciting players that. I mean, we're the basically the athlete of a generation. Correct. Yeah. I so he, here's why that story frustrates me. It, it frustrates me that I keep seeing it because of everything that would have been involved in that having come true. Now we couldn't substantiate the numbers. We tried to go back and figure out what the stock would have been worth at the IPO. That math didn't make sense to me. So I don't know if he was factoring in, obviously, the shoe sales because it was going to be like a dollar per pair of shoes sold. So I don't know if he was factoring in that revenue and how many units he eventually moved. Uh, I don't know. I, I can't get to the exact math on how that was worth $5 billion. But let's assume that he's right. But that would have also meant holding a single stock in a very concentrated position for almost 45 years. Let's talk about how tough that is. Right. I mean, Nike has gone through its own share of successes and failures along that 45-year period, too. Not to mention the personal needs that come up along the way, right? The Nike stock, if he had taken the deal, is an asset that you can use for other things. So if you need liquidity, you're going to look to things like that to cash out and buy a sports franchise or whatever it is you're looking to do. Yeah, between 1982 and 1984, quoting a Motley Fool article on this, by the way, Nike down 66%. So within the first five years he would have owned it, he would have gone through a period where it drops to a third of its value, right? I, I think, you know, that sort of patience is rare. It, it is so easy to look at this. And similarly, by the way, we could have just as easily said, well, if Magic had taken that hundred grand that Converse had paid him and invested into IBM stock, right? And I think Microsoft IPO'd in 86 or something. So, so like, it, I'm trying to pick a company that would have been around actually in the year that, that he was there. Could we have been talking about similar results? Like, is that the magic of Nike? Or is that the magic of simply being an incredibly long-term investor way past the period that most people would be able to put up with a single stock volatility and that concentration risk. And you and I both worked with an advisor. He's been on our show, Sean Gates, who, if you follow him on X or Twitter, or whatever we're calling it these days, unlike most advisors, Sean is appreciative of single stock concentration risk. So shout out to Sean. And I think that is such a double-edged sword for people on how much of a single stock are you willing to bet on. And this comes up in my brain a lot, especially when people say things like, well, can I get there faster? Can I accelerate the path to wealth creation? And single stock ownership in many ways is the answer, but it cuts just as fast in both directions. Yeah, I was speaking with clients just the other day who we built a age 65 retirement plan for them and they wanted to talk about what we could do to get to that goal faster and we were talking about age 55. Then as throughout the course of the conversation it came up, well what about if we could get there at age 45? And the conversation turned to like what types of things could make that happen? Because those are going to be factors that are largely outside of your control. And one of those things could be exposure to a single stock like that. In particular, we were talking about like employer equity. Like They were fortunate enough to have exposure to their employer's equity of a private company. That could blow up. But that's also risky if you're going to continue to accumulate wealth in a private employer, which may never go public, it may not succeed in the long run, it might not be liquid. But if we're talking about like life changing events, that could be one of them if you're willing to take that risk. Yeah. And, and I think of that so much for people that work at early stage companies where a lot of their comp tends to be in equity. 
right? So there, there's many examples of basically this exact same situation. A company saying, similar to the way Nike told Magic, hey, listen, we don't have the cash to do this right now. We're not big enough to simply buy our way into this game. But what we're willing to give you is a piece of what we're doing here. And if that becomes special, you're going to be more than rich. And that's where I think it's really relatable is there's a lot of people that are in that situation. Not that we're going back and and rehashing the past and saying, oh, shoulda, coulda, woulda, if only I had had the foresight to be that patient, to to know what was coming. But people that have the opportunity right now to be invested in similar possibility companies where you could have that kind of a breakout. And it simply comes down to, does that business have an edge? Are they being led by somebody that can help them realize it? And are they going to execute? So looking at Magic's opportunity in particular, I mean, what I like about something like that is he was the edge. So if you want to make a bet, you're not necessarily a passive participant in this endeavor. Like you are the thing that they are going to be marketing. So to some extent, your play on the court will impact your wealth because you're selling your own product, much like Michael Jordan did years later. Like Air Jordan brand is king. Still to this very day, like M- Michael has made tons as you're more wearing money. Under Armour, I mean, as come I'm wearing on now. Under Armour, <laughs> hey, got to rep Maryland wherever I can. There you go. Yeah, shout out uh, to Kevin Plank. Yeah, I have, I have funny stories of early Under Armour shoes. Speaking of the shoe world, but um, Jordan knew that his brand was powerful, and he was willing to live by it. Magic took the cash. I can understand that too. So you know, if you're talking about practical application of single stock exposure. Like if you're in the driver's seat, I find that meaningful. Like if you're starting your own company and know that you have the tools to build it into something, I tend to be more comfortable with tying up some of your wealth in something like that versus making a single stock investment in a publicly traded company where you're really at the whim of the leadership team. And and maybe you have a unique ability to read into the possibilities of a company and the leadership team and you're very well informed on fundamental analysis. But again, you're then just going to put your money there and sit and wait and hope that you are right over whatever period you have. And first of all, Dan, for what it's worth, you've done that, right? Being an owner in this business that we're running together, being an owner in the brewery that you're a part of, right? Like, I think you have made that bet on yourself. And I, I appreciate that about you. I think you and I are in alignment there that I'd rather have the wheel in my hand than simply have capital behind people that I may or may not trust, right? I think that's why evaluating that leadership team and and not just are they in a business that is doing well, but will they guide a business doing well, right? Or are they, do you trust the people that are making those decisions or do you have an influence there? I think that matters quite a bit. So when it comes to how you evaluate this for clients, what is your approach to a single stock holding that has become dominant? Whether that means something that is an employer stock plan where, you know, maybe it's tough to unwind. Maybe it is just accumulating because of grants or for tax reasons, you've continued to hold it. Or or even just a stock portfolio where it's gotten big, quote unquote, the right way, where you bought something, it has ballooned, and you have continued to be patient with that stock. Are you in the, hey, we should be trimming this back category, or does it depend on the client for you? For me, it depends on a couple things. I mean, the first thing I ask is, this is your biggest holding. Like Most of your money is tied up into this one thing. Is that the thing you believe in the most? I think that's a relevant and important question Like before we get into all the actual other implications of that. But if that's not true, then we might want to reevaluate how much money is in that business or that stock. So here's where I land on it. And I, I think I've said this before, but I think that this framework is really important. And I will continue to beat the drum on it a little bit. I think traditional finance approaches this question from how do you reduce any unnecessary risk, right? That is the rational economist point of view is that there's no reason ever to take a risk that is unnecessary. Why would you do that? That is that is irrational. If you didn't have to play in traffic, you shouldn't, right? The flip side of it is that I think if you've done what you should be doing, 
in terms of building a strong foundation, I think you buy yourself the privilege to do that and to take the additional risk. And here's what I mean by that. Let's say that I'm saving 15% of my income into an ultra diversified index fund based 401k plan. And that plan on its own by saving 15%, that will allow me to retire at 65 kind of traditional ish retirement age, depending give or take on a handful of years, but a 15% savings rate. I'm doing that. I'm putting that baseline in place. That is the core of my plan. If I take any amount of my capital above that and make a different bet, and I'm basically saying I'm on track for 65, but I could shortcut it. And if this goes to zero, I'm still on track. That's a very different place than saying I'm betting my age 65 retirement comfort on this accelerated plan. So to me, the question is, is the gamble with something in addition to your core kind of baseline plan? Are you playing with house money, so to speak? Now, it's not house money because you're still saving it. It's still your capital. You still have alternatives. You've still got opportunities outside of that single individual company risk. So it, it's not house money, but from a planning perspective, it could be. If you're saying, I'm okay with this outcome, but if I can get a little bit more, if I can get it a little bit faster, if I can do it a little bit better, that's what I would choose to do. And I'm willing to gamble there. That's a very different situation than just betting everything on whatever the up and coming hot stock is. I think you and I may have worked collaboratively on this plan that I'm about to talk about, but I, I have clients who are in retirement who have a very large portfolio relative to what they spend each year. And something like 70% of that portfolio is in a single large company stock. <laughs> we were doing an investment review. That's obviously a red flag when we're looking at it. When we stress test the portfolio, I took it to the extreme and said, what if that went to zero, which I don't think is a realistic possibility given yep. the, the company that it is. If it went to zero, we would still have incredibly high confidence in that plan. So it doesn't matter as long as they're okay with the fact that your portfolio balance is going to fluctuate very heavily depending on how that single company moves. It won't affect your, your spending or your retirement plan or anything like that. But those numbers might be very volatile. And if you're comfortable with that, do we really care if you're getting the outcome that you're looking for? I think the answer is no. So it does go back to what you're trying to accomplish and the tools you have available to do that. And by keeping that single stock position, assuming that's in like a brokerage account or some sort of after-tax basis, yeah. incredibly tax efficient, right? If, if you can pass that on, if you can be super concentrated like that and then pass that on, I mean, that speaking of magic, right? That, that totally. is the magic is if you can pass that on and get that step up in basis for the second generation, please excuse my super cheesy play on words there. But that's where it gets really special is to not only create wealth like that, but then flick of a switch and it becomes a tax-free generational event. Yeah. No, I mean, no kidding. If you can die with a highly appreciated asset, that's, that's golden for a uh, estate plan. Yeah. I do think that it's tough because, you know, so much of why people aspire to have wealth is to live a different lifestyle than they're living right now, right? Like, as I think about making more money than I make, as I think about having more wealth than I have, as I hear clients talking about it, it's not that they're hoping just to see their balances go up. It's that they're hoping they can do more. They can travel more freely. Maybe that means more trips per year. Maybe that means flying first class or flying private rather than, you know, sitting coach and squishing yourself into a seat, which I particularly identify with as a pretty tall guy. Uh, I, I think you probably do as well. Like I, I struggle on an airplane. So to me, I'm like, oh man, if I felt comfortable doing that, that would be what a level up, right? Yeah. That's like the opposite of wealth creation. <laughs> Right? right, it really is. It's, you know, all you're all you're really looking for in that circumstance is the permission to feel good about spending more of your money. Now, maybe the balances being higher make you feel like you have that permission, 
But that's really the antithesis of actually building wealth, where, where what we're really looking for is just to sit tight, to be patient, and to sit on your hands for as long as possible. And then I go back in time to Magic, sitting in that chair, having to make a decision between Converse and Nike, who, who didn't come from a lot. And here you're given like a six-figure payout from Converse, which is real money and something you can consume and touch and feel for him and his family versus what seems like fantasy money. And I can see why that decision is, is so difficult and we have the benefit of hindsight. But if you know, I, I wonder if we went back in time to that point and had to advise him on what to do, where we would fall, because I don't think it's as easy as it sounds, you know, as we debate it today. There's no question because going back to the IPO, which I think was at what, 22 bucks for Nike, and he was being so. offered 100,000 shares or something like that. Mm -hmm. So we can do the math on what 100,000 shares at $22 would have been, right? That's $2.2 .2 million in cash. The same question would basically be the flip side of it. If you had $2.2 .2 million in cash, would you buy $2.2 .2 million worth of Nike stock? Right. And the answer is you know, probably not, right? Like if somebody right. gave you $2 million worth of stock, you'd be like hyped. And at the yeah. same time, if you had that cash, you would never spend it on $2 million worth of a single company stock. Yeah, totally. Right. That, that's effectively the decision. Right, exactly. Which is the hardest part of investing, by the way, because in theory, when you're evaluating your portfolio, that's the question you should be asking yourself almost all the time is forget that I already own this. Would I still want to own it? And that's, that's hard once you've made a decision about it already. I mean, I, I can't tell you how many times I've had that conversation. And I love that question. I think it's a beautiful question, to quote David Gardner, to go to throw back to, to the fool again. It, when I talk to people and they're like, well, this is my portfolio and maybe I've got a few rinky dink stocks in here that, you know, I, I'm just hanging on to them because they've done poorly. They've gone down a lot, but maybe they'll, they'll come back. And I'm like, great. If I took your portfolio to cash right now, would you buy these? Even in the same amounts you have today? And they're like, no. Okay. <laughs> yeah. You just answered it. If you wouldn't buy it again today, you know, again, I think there's taxes. I think there's other implications, but especially in a losing position, get it out of there. If you wouldn't buy it again today and you're just like waiting around, pull the weeds. Dude, we have that conversation all the time internally between you and me. Yep. Constantly. Yeah. It's a hard yep. one. It's, it's very difficult. And, and yeah, and there's a lot of anchoring once you've made that initial purchase. We are not immune to it. We are, we are both aware of the bias and still suffer from it. And so I'm not trying to make it sound like this is easy, but I do think that's where having a, a, an objective third party is a huge difference, right? Because I think having that, that extra layer of questioning of going, well, how, think about that same question you're asking through a slightly different lens, and then it immediately snaps into focus for you. So either way, magic made it to a billion dollars. Plus, quite a bit more, it sounds like. And, and who knows, when he ultimately sells the Commanders one day after we've won many more Super Bowls, this is all, all in my fantasy land. But, but I think he could help us get there. I appreciate having a winner on the team and an owner that is like not silently pouting in the owner's box that is willing to get out and actually talk about what's going on with the athletes. Like Dan Snyder would have never said that. No, not at all. I mean, the new ownership group, I'm, I'm thrilled. Uh, all they've done is come and ingratiate themselves with the fans. And I know we're talking very home team sports here, but I know we you are. and I have been commiserating for decades. Uh, yeah, no, it's, it's been bad. It's been bad to be a commander's fan of this era. Cause I, I think you and I are of the age where we basically barely remember the last wins. Yeah, we missed experiencing the Super Bowls. Yeah. Like, well, and so I'm a we, couple We years grew younger. up with people telling us your team has a proud tradition of winning. And we're like, cool, yeah. can't wait for that to start. Yeah, I have a Heath Schuler jersey. Is that part of the proud tradition of winning? Because that was <laughs> yeah. my first jersey that I owned. I'm going to get hyped over a Mark Rippon jersey. Anyway, yeah. we will get off the football stuff. We hope that you took something away from this. I think the key here to, to put a nice bow on it 
is, is not to beat yourself up over past financial decisions. Like I, I think I could go back and, and kick myself thousands of times for things that I could have invested in and been patient with over my lifetime. That is an unproductive exercise. I think the, the productive use of time is to say, given the information I had at the time, did I make the right choice for myself, for my family, for my circumstances? And if my judgment was clouded, have I started to figure that out and incorporate something to balance out that bias in the future? Whether that be another advisor, whether that be awareness of a blind spot, that to me is the real learning is that we continue to improve. We're playing the hand that we have today, not the one we had 20 years ago or 10 years ago. You're playing the hand that you have today. Make the best choices possible with it. Yeah, absolutely. And if you have any thoughts, definitely write in. Check your balances at outlook.com. We're gearing up for another mailbag edition. So it'd be great to have some new questions to address and some wine keys to send out. I believe I'm caught up on everything, at least that I've been forwarded as far as mailing wine keys. Uh, hopefully you enjoy those as much as we enjoy hearing from you. We look forward to catching up with you guys on the next episode. <laughs>